Hello, it's Ren Presents Time. I'm your host, Ren, and today we continue with the Shadow Tech Goddess Part 2, Chapter 4, already, Sar Fortnum College. So when we last picked up with this crazy story, Paymaster Stenstrom and his lady-in-waiting, Lady Gwendolyn Apprentice, contacted the enigmatic and slightly arrogant Hannah Ben Sherlamp EVOR from the University of D to ply her with questions about the Shrine of Baraster and its possible location on the planet Ing. Very quickly they found the professor turning the tables on them and questioning them. Why would they, a bunch of spacefarers, want to know about something out of mythology, basically? And Stenstrom let it slip that they need to go to Ing, or go to the Shrine of Baraster. And that caught her attention, and then she's like, what do you know? What do you know? And they wouldn't say, and then Aram and Alesta returned. They muted the comm, and they said, hey, we made a mistake. We thought Messalina was the name of that crazy Order of Lacerda lady with the foul mouth they'd fought at the ruins of Caroline. But no, it was actually a code name for Hannah Ben Sherlamp. But using technological methods, Hannah Ben Sherlamp had managed to disable their disabling and heard every word they said. She started saying, well, you know, I'm an interested buyer. If I'm the one who rediscovers Ing, I will be trumpeted in the scholarly circles, and that's very important to me. And she started offering them a lot of money to let her in on what information they had, because she knows they've got something, but they wouldn't say, and eventually they retreated to the bowels of the ship where she couldn't get to them via technological methods. Don't think we've seen the last of Hannah Ben Sherlamp. No, now that she thinks that info is to be had, there's going to be no getting rid of her. A quick note on Hannah Ben Sherlamp. She is an EVOR, and people ask me, what is that? That is basically my version of a, of a PhD. You have the E, and the E degree is like a like a bachelor's like a ba or a bs and you have the vo which stands for vor sham which is sort of like a master's degree and then you have the r and i, I never created a, a meaning for the r so but evor and it takes a long time to get this it takes about four years of concentrated study to get an e degree just like it would here on earth the VO takes about 20 years to get to get this master's part. And then the R is about 30 or 40 years. So it can take 60 or 70 years to get become an EVOR. But that doesn't really matter much in this League of Elder because people live a lot longer than we do here on Earth. That's not her only title. She's got a lot more. Her official title is... Professor Emeritus, University of D, E-V-O-R, Q-R-D-U-P, N-V-P-H-D, Grand Sequitur Hobanus Realis, and Knight of Baz. That's a mouthful, isn't it? But that's her, that's her mojo, that's her stuff, and she's quite proud of it. And I'm also proud... Proud of Cass Peace who read her lines. Cass will be joining us briefly again today as we have not seen the last of Hannah Ben. And we're going to be seeing her for a little bit today. So let's proceed immediately, shall we? Part 2, Chapter 4, Sarfortnum College. Aram put the rip car down at the ship park at the far southern end of Blansford Village docks. Stenstrom and Gwendolyn jumped out, their boots making a pounding hollow sound on the wooden planks of the dock. Aram and Alesta remained within. We must leave, Aram said, but don't worry, we'll be back at the correct time. 
With that, they sealed containment, and Aram lifted the little craft away, moving to the south along the edge of the coast past the elephant swim. Gwen and Bell stood there for a moment and took everything in. Blanchford Village. From the south side docks, the place looked bewildering, a tumbled collection of huddled wooden buildings and taut narrow streets following the long natural curve of the bay. At first glance, it might be considered a salty, barbary city like those found in Calvert. However, the buildings past the docks were all perfectly straight up and down, and the architecture was distinctly vith in precision and design. A few vith domes of stone and copper peaked above the rooftops. Beyond the buildings was a steep shelf of impressive mountains that climbed into the heights. Perched at the top was Castle Blanchford, elegant and dominating as always. Behind the castle was the low-hanging green fog of the Telmus Grove. Gwendolyn felt the cold wind blowing in from the bay and closed her coat. It's freezing. She placed a protective hand on her scar. It's making my face hurt. Her long brown hair caught the breeze and took flight. How can these vis stand it here? Stenstrom and his HRN felt just right. Dav's never admitted it to me, but I'm pretty sure the Vith are impervious to cold. Doesn't bother them in the least. You'll get used to it, Gwen. Holding her coat shut, she looked around and didn't seem overly taken with the place. Yes, she said in a somewhat haughty tone. Very Vith. Gwen, what is your continual dislike for the Vith? I think this place is breathtaking, especially Dav's castle up there. He pointed up into the mountains. Proper Xenons prefer a more subdued surroundings. Gwen, you promised not to fall into your Xenon shell again, remember? Take a look around and enjoy what you see. She considered his words a moment, then laughed, her breath coming out in a cloud. You're right, you're right. She sighed and looked around, this time with a less stern eye. What is pretty, and the castle belongs to your friend, the great Captain Davidge, then it's a place to be respected. Well, that'll do, I guess. He looked at the dock, the permanent moorings for the new faith, Captain Davidge's Triumph-class ship, were empty. The captain and his countess Sigillus were gone again, fearing the stars, no doubt with several of their children. Dotting the dock and the street corners were five-foot-tall plaster statues of Countess Sigillus, each painted in a bright, fanciful color scheme. What are these statues? Gwen asked. I think they were donated by the captain and the countess. They placed them all over the village and invited the children from Cyan Town to paint them. They then personally judged each one and invited the artists of their favorites to the castle for dinner and a tour. Interesting thought, Gwen remarked. These statues would be better life-size, though. Stenstrom chuckled. They are life-size, Gwen. The Countess is not a tall woman. I wish Dav and Sig were here today. I'd love to see them and properly introduce you. Perhaps next time, Gwen replied, taking note of a statue painted bright green. Of course, we're not really here for fun and visiting, are we? The dock wasn't completely empty. A few berthings down, several merchant vessels were lined up innocuously in the water, as well as a fleet sprint ship. Long, 12 decks high, and slightly tubular in shape, the medium-sized vessel with its tiny wings placed well aft reminded Stenstrom of a capital T. I had the opportunity to board a sprint ship. Gwen said, admiring the sleek lines of the vessel. Not long ago, my uncle suggested it. Why didn't you? Need you ask? I'll just stay an engineer aboard the old warbird seeker turned privateer with the man I love. He took her arm and they strolled north. Gwen became accustomed to the cold and let her coat fall open. Where's this college, she asked, holding his arm. At the northern end of the village. We've a ways to walk. They'd gone a few more blocks, the village deceptively spread out and vast. They passed a ramshackle pub that was a little crooked in relation to the buildings around it. 
A sweet-smelling cloud drifted out into the cold air. Smells good, Gwendolyn said, taking it in. A wooden sign swinging on a chain announced the pub as the Drunken Eel. It's Honey Ale, he said. Oh, this pub is a favorite of my friend Lieutenant Kylos. I wonder if she's in there right now. The Marine? Isn't she pregnant? Ex-Marine. And she is, but that's not gonna stop her from tossing back. He went to the doors and looked in. Lots of people in there. Let's see. Gwendolyn put her arms around his waist and pulled him away from the door. Come on, Belle. We can look for your friends later. Moving on, they passed the massive dome of St. Vith Cathedral and entered the tree-lined outskirts of the college area. Sarfortnum College was built in a classic configuration, with the main building situated around a central green, featuring a Vith Fox Shrine and radiating outward several blocks in a confined but orderly manner. Twenty brownstone buildings huddled there off the green, and many more dormitories and ancillary structures spread out farther to the north. Even the ever-skeptical Gwendolyn had to suck in her breath a little at the stone, horseshoe-shaped pitch where brant ball games were frequently played. Columned and buttressed, the arena was a true masterpiece of Vith design. They wandered about a bit, getting the lay of the land. If I were an ancient elder artifact, where would I hide, he asked, looking around. Aram and Alesta didn't say they were hidden. They said they were on full display. Let's find the administrative building. I'll wager they've got a small museum within, or perhaps a series of display cases set up for viewing. I am highly skilled at locating museums. Good to know, he replied, not quite sure what to make of that. They found the Venslar Science and Administrative Building at the north end of the campus. A handsome edifice with a large Sarfortnum eagle carved over the entryway. Gwendolyn, positively giddy, pulled him inside. Apparently, she was an avid museum enthusiast. Inside, they found a confusion of corridors and wood-paneled rooms. They passed a large room marked Amphitheater, populated by many people in magenta-colored robes. Gwendolyn couldn't help but open the door and pop her head in to see what was going on. It was some sort of medical seminar presided over by several hospitalers in their black and silver robes. They were dissecting a cadaver as the audience of scholars looked on. Rather squeamish, Gwen closed the door and continued on, pulling Stenstrom with her. Ah, she cried, pointing ahead. Here! A small sign promising a collection of artifacts discovered in the North Vithland area pointed down a flight of steps. They descended and entered a small but inviting setup with a number of softly lit cases and stands lined with shelves loaded with various sized trinkets. The place was quiet, somber lighting, red carpeting. Few people browsed the displays. The whole place was rather sedate and forlorn. Stenstrom just wanted to run through the displays and locate their objective, but Gwen took his arm, deliberately slow in her search. She took her time, leaning over and carefully examining each displayed item, reading the placards, even the ones that couldn't possibly be what they were looking for. Gwen, we don't have the time for this. I won't hear of it, she said. A visit to a museum isn't a race, Bell. When I enter a museum, I make it a point to appreciate everything. Ah, yes, these are lovely pieces. I believe I'm beginning to take an interest in Vith artifacts, despite myself. Fine time for it. Moving at a snail's crawl, they advanced from one case to another, Gwendolyn not continuing on until she had fully taken in everything. It was maddening. Quite a collection, isn't it? Came a voice from behind. They turned. Standing there holding a brochure was a male fleet captain and a blue-haired female lieutenant wearing a large hat. Gwendolyn stood up straight, her fedula clinking against the glass. Captain, good day to you, sir. Good day, lieutenant, he replied. I wasn't expecting to see any fleet personnel here this afternoon, as we're the only league ship berthed at present. Our ship is in orbit, sir. 
Greetings, I am Lieutenant Gwendolyn, Lady Apprentice, Chief Engineer of the Fleet Warbird Seeker. The captain studied Bell's face a moment, then slapped the brochure to his leg. Ah, the Seeker, our celebrated new privateer. If that's the case, by chance are you Sir Paymaster Stenstrom, the ship's appointed captain? You must be. I'd heard you wear an old HRN coat, and here it is, sure enough. Very striking. Stenstrom, Lord of Belmont, South Tyrol, at your service. Lieutenant Gwendolyn is my countess-in-waiting. They shook hands. Ah, congratulations. Please allow me. I am Captain Duval, Lord of Wilshire, commander of the fleet sprint ship George Parr. Perhaps you saw her parked in the bay. And this is my first officer, Lieutenant Rem Deckard. Gwendolyn thought a moment. Captain Duval, I've heard your name. Weren't you decorated for bravery at, at the Battle of Merendera One? Aye. Hiding under her hat and a curtain of blue bangs, Rem Deckard offered a vague smile and held out her hand. Stenstrom saw hints of complex tattoos on her hand as he shook it. Her hand was warm and electric. Captain Duval smiled warmly. It's always good to become acquainted with our fellow fleet, especially those brave heroes in the privateer service, providing the much-needed funds the fleet requires to survive. Very unappreciated lot, the privateers. Have you lunched? Perhaps we might sit a spell and get up to date. Gwendolyn wanted to accept their offer, but waited for Stenstrom to give his confirmation. He pondered for a moment, then said, Sure, why not? Captain Duval was elated. Wonderful, shall we? We saw a lovely cafe just a short walk away that claims to specialize in classic Remnath fare. I could do with a taste of home so far north. They all left the museum and headed to the cafe. After they finished lunch, Bell and Gwen waved goodbye to their new acquaintances and walked several blocks away, twisting and turning through the streets, eventually ending up in a small, smoky tavern inn near the cathedral. Stenstrom paid for a room for the night, and they clambered up the narrow stairs, located their room, and went in. Belle, what are we doing? Shouldn't we press on our search? She went to the window to throw open the curtains and admit some sunshine. Greenish light from the Terrigrin sign outside lit up her face in an emerald hue. Leave those closed, he said. He locked the door and, with rapid shakes of his hand, produced holy stones and silver holders resembling small candlesticks. Gwendolyn, always fascinated by Stenstrom's Tyrol sorcery, sat down on the bed and watched. What are you doing? she asked, unclipping her fedula and leaning it against the wall. She removed her fleet hat and fluffed her hair in the mirror. Stenstrom was busy at his arcane work. He placed three silver holders in a triangular configuration on the floor and carefully set a blue, dark green, and mottled yellow holy stone into the cup of each one. Try not to move around too much, Gwen. The vibration could knock the stones loose. Fascinated, she smiled, removed her coat, and took off her boots, setting them aside. All right, I'll be careful. She flopped onto her stomach to watch, and the green holy stone fell to the wooden floor. Gwen, what did I just say? He picked it back up and returned it to the cup. Sorry, you aren't going to teach me this field of study once we're married, yes? She said, holding her arms out, admiring her watch. If you want to learn, I'll teach you. Now, watch your movements, please. She lifted her feet and slowly bobbed them back and forth. I will. So again, what are we doing? If we're staying here, we need to contact the ship and give them an update. Tara's going to be getting worried, and I didn't bring an overnight bag. We'll update the ship in a bit. He pulled a purple holy stone from his coat. He placed it on one of the silver candlestick holders and set it alight. It belched bluish aromatic smoke that quickly drifted around the room. He set his pistols down and inspected his work with the holy stones. He then joined her on the bed, the springs squeaking. What's all this smoke? Gwen asked. We shall be able to temporarily speak freely. 
The smoke will jam any technological ears that might be listening, and these additional holy stones will warn us if we're being spied upon. I've a distinct feeling our new friends are not what they seem. The captain in his first? I thought they were enchanting. She slid him out of his HRN and set it on the floor. You and all your stuff, Belle. She coiled around him and they lay back, getting comfortable. You didn't find it odd that we'd meet a pair of fleet personnel in an out-of-the-way museum in the science and administration building of Sarfortnum College? Well, why not? I was enjoying the displays. Gwen, I've been to Blanchard Village enough times to know that fleet personnel on shore leave don't spend their off hours browsing in museums when other, more primal pursuits beckon. I have a distinct suspicion Professor Sherlamp is afoot. Oh, please, she sighed. You're not giving this woman her proper due. So what are you suggesting? That a professor from Calvert counts under her employ a fleet captain and his first officer? That is exactly what I'm suggesting. Line a man's pocket with enough silver and he'll try anything. Gwendolyn considered the notion. Captain Duval is a hero. Heroes can be bought, too. How, then, if you're correct, did they track our movements? We filed a flight plan with Fleetcom, and when we came down in the rip car, they knew exactly where we were headed. How would Professor Sherlamp have access to that information? I would say it's quite easy for a well-connected person of means and intelligence to hack the fleet's low-rent traffic. Lieutenant Kylos's husband does it all the time. Therefore, I think it's best... The two of us fall off the grid for the time being. We must assume any standardized traffic to the fleet is being scrutinized. Okay, Belle. Assuming your logic is correct, what do you think we should do? She whispered. We wait until nightfall. Then we sneak back to the college and fetch the objects in question. But we didn't locate them. I did, just as the captain arrived. I think I saw them in a corner case. So we'll break in, borrow them, and then sneak back. Gwendolyn checked her watch again. Night falls a few bells away. Let's get comfortable. In the green terrigrin light, she unbuckled her belt and slid out of her pants, letting them fall to the floor. She was down to her shirt, knickers, socks, and watch. She began undoing Stenstrom's clothes, setting them aside until he was down to the same. Gwen, are you certain you don't wish to simply toss in and give Professor Sherlamp what she wants? It probably isn't too late. None of this sneaking around is really necessary. Gwen absently watched the smoke dance around the room. Oh, I'm positive now more than ever. The day we allow a tenured brat to intimidate us shall be a cold one indeed. Gwendolyn smiled and got on top of him, kissing his neck. Besides, I think this is kind of romantic, don't you? You and me here in this village in a contest with a ridiculous scholar from Calvert? They lay on the bed in the quiet first stages of making careful but passionate love. A suborbital rumbled down the street. One of the holy stones came out of its silver holder and fell to the floor, and then a second fell, and finally a third. They both stopped and stared at them. They discovered the sophisticated bugs placed on their coats later that afternoon. Tiny, barely thicker than a hair and made of a tacky synthetic material splayed out in a network of vein-like conductors, they found four on Stenstrom's HRN and three on Gwendolyn's fleet coat. Gwendolyn fumed. They decided not to deactivate them as that would further prod Professor Sherlamp. Instead, they spent the afternoon in their room, keeping their conversations to a minimum and throwing out fake clues as they worked out their plan to grab the artifacts. Stenstrom contacted the ship and informed them they were enjoying the sights and would call for a rip car in the morning. Tara, as expected, put up a fuss, but Stenstrom calmed her. They then ordered dinner in from the tavern downstairs, ate, and worked out a plan. The smoke from the Holy Stone began to give out. Looks like we need a fresh holy stone, Gwen said. I don't have any more of these purple ones. We'll need to mind our words. And then Gwen laid a bombshell on him. Without opening her mouth, she spoke to him loud and clear. Well, since we're now formal, and no husband and wife should maintain secrets, I'll tell you, 
Xenons are quite widely telepathic, much more so than Remnaths and Esters, and even more than the Vith. The sisters office put us through various tests to gauge our abilities, and if you score up, they paint you red and stamp you with the word Cordra for telepath. It's all kept private, but I never wanted to be examined in such a fashion and painted up like Morgan is. I deliberately softened my abilities and so got a low score and was forgotten. I make it a point to keep it bottled up when away from Prentice, though Morgan can often tap my thoughts with her empathetic tendencies. Always full of surprises, he responded. And one more thing, my family can perform something we seldom speak of. I call it the pop. I can focus my thoughts to the point where I can disable an individual from a great distance. I thought to use it on you during our little chase way back when, but decided not to as I wished everything to be above board. It wouldn't have been fair. The holy stone crumbled to ash. Pretty place, isn't it, Gwen? I suppose in the morning we'll head out to Hoban, he said, making a show for the ears listening from afar. Thanks for that. Come dark. I'll head back to the campus to collect the artifacts. You stay here. I can hide in the shadows and not be seen. It's growing on me, I must admit, Gwendolyn said. Actually, I agree with you. I cannot believe that these two would dare place rigs on us and smile while doing so. I think what I'll do is stay here in our room and cover you. So you'll cover me from afar and pop any unfriendlies who might happen by? Can you really knock a person out with your thoughts? I've never tried before, but I know I can generate enough force to do some good. When the sun went down, he quietly exited their room and went downstairs. He stayed to the shadows, following the narrow stairwell down into the noisy tavern, unseen. He moved through the crowded room, past all the people deep into their cups and their games, wondering if any were spies from Hannah Ben Sherlamp. If she was invested enough to secure the services of a fleet captain and load him out with ruinously expensive rigs, then nothing could be put past her. And sure enough, there she was in bold 3D on a four-rent holocone near the bar, wigged, powdered, frothy white, all smiles. She spoke in a hypnotic fashion in her regal accent. And remember, it is never too late to seek out advice and proper counsel. A new day has dawned, and all accounts are clean. Nothing is beyond my reach. All one need do is seek me out. He was certain that the message was intended for him and Gwen alone. He moved out unnoticed into the cold night air. Can you hear me, Belle? came Gwen's thoughts. He winced a little at the force of it. Loud and clear, wow, you really do have some skill. As I said, I am a Xenon after all. It feels so good to finally allow myself to let loose in your presence. We are the most telepathic of the seven tribes. 8. You're forgetting Tyrol. Tyrol's not a tribe, Bell. How his mother would be turning over in her grave at that one. A discussion for another time. Sh Professor Sherlamp is sparing no expense in seeking us out. She wants us to know there's no hard feelings and we may come to her at any time. Let her waste her coin, Bell. She is not an issue here. Fine, then. I'm heading north. Passing the unsuspecting people strolling down the street, he moved north, past the shoppers crowding Rundle Way, past the cathedral into the campus area. It was dark and fairly empty of people when he arrived. He quickly vaulted to the top of a nearby building and looked around. He crept to the science and administration building and dropped down. I'm here, Gwen. Okay. The doors were locked and held shut with a fairly sophisticated maglock system. A few moments later, with the correct tools from his coat, he was in, encountering several more locked doors as he went.
He passed the amphitheater that had spooked Gwen and located the stairs leading down to the museum and took them. When he got to the bottom, he discovered the museum had been cleaned out, the cases emptied, glass doors swinging ajar. A sign sat off to the side of the entrance reading, The Embry Vith display has been temporarily closed by order of the Stellar Fleet. Sarfortnum College administrators apologize for the inconvenience. The museum will reopen soon. Stenstrom stood there and shook his head. Gwen, the museum is gone. Gone? Her telepathic voice had a distinctly tinny sound to it. The viewing area has been cleaned out. The display cases are empty. A sign says the items on display have been seized by order of the fleet and will be returned at a later date. Oh, that little powdered weasel. I must hand it to her. There's no quit in that woman. So with this current development in mind, are you certain you don't wish to amend your position, dine on a little bit of crow and admit the professor into our plans? Absolutely not, especially after this development. We shall not be bullied about by these harassing antics. It's clear she has no direction in which to turn and is hoping to glean some sort of clue from the artifacts themselves. I'll wager, if our hypothesis is correct, that the pieces are, at this moment, under lock and key in Captain Duval's sprint ship. Stenstrom quickly made his way up the stairs. I agree. I'm heading there now. He passed the amphitheater and paused. The door now stood wide open. Came a voice. It wasn't Gwendolyn's mental voice. It was someone else. In here. Curious, he looked in. There were several rows of comfortable elevated seats and a flat platform at the bottom. A gurney and a silent form covered in a sheet sat in the center of the platform. He wondered what was the cadaver still doing there. Who's there? he asked. The form on the gurney sat up with deathly slowness and turned its head to look at him. The sheet came away. A pale, diabolical face came to light, eyes glinting, teeth showing in a graveyard smile. Stenstrom was filled with an unearthly feeling of fear, total fear. He'd felt it before, in Clovis, he was certain of it. What had Alesta said? The Shadow Tech Goddess came and filled you with fear. She killed your Countess. The figure stood and eased forward, holding its clawed hands up. You can't get away from me, Belle. Summoning what strength he had left, he TK'd out of the building into the night air, grim laughter following him. He soared to the top of a nearby building and took up a defensive position, ints at the ready. Nothing came out of the building. The campus was still and peaceful. The overwhelming coffin of fear that had taken him faded and was replaced by a rush of endorphins, giving him a minor euphoric feeling. Bell, what are you doing? came Gwen's telepathic voice. I thought I saw someone in the building. Who? I don't, I don't know, a corpse, a demon. A corpse? I'm not picking anybody else up in the, your vicinity. Perhaps that smoke you breathed in all afternoon got in your head. Made me feel a bit dizzy. Get moving. We don't have all night. He tore across the darkened campus past St. Viff's and south along the edge of the bay near where the elephants crossed the water. The crowds of people strolling about in the chilly night air increased as he neared the heart of the village. He TK'd above the rooftops to be clear. Ahead, Floating on its pylons like a winged serpent and lit up in panning lights was the George Parr, Captain Duval's sprint ship. The gangways were sealed and a detail of marines guarded the entrance points at the docks. The ship is closed off and sealed with marines prowling the gangway, he sent to Gwendolyn. So they've got their booty on lockdown, do they? Gwendolyn sent back. It won't stop us. Check the aft dorsal area near the wings. Sprint ships have a blowport that they routinely open to vent their life support systems when they're grounded. You should be able to get in that way. 
Stenstrom drifted over the ship, marveling at its ramrod straight design, which was quite a departure from the flowing, swan like shape of the seeker orbiting high above. Farther back, near the wing assembly, he spotted the open port Gwen had mentioned. It was hissing and steaming slightly in the chilly night air. He crawled in down a narrow tube until he had reached a lock grate. He produced a lock picking set and had it open after a few moments. I'm in, Gwen. Good. Head down to cargo areas on deck four. I'll wager that's where the artifacts are being kept. Still faded into the shadows, he drifted down through the ship's corridors, passing numerous crewmen and officers along the way, none aware of his presence. Reaching deck four with ease, he heard activity coming from cargo bay two. He drifted to the entrance. Sure enough, inside, arranged on row after row of temporary tables, were the contents of the museum, all the artifacts carefully laid out. A black-haired female crewman took vids of each object with a floating hollow camera and scribbled notes on a pad. A male crewman laid out more objects, shuttling back and forth from the tables to an open crate. Watching the two of them work was Lieutenant Rem Deckard, Captain Duval's first officer, still hiding under her huge hat and blue hair. I want these items inventoried and cataloged as quickly as possible, and report back to me when the task is complete. Understand? She said in a stern voice. Yes, ma'am, the female crewman answered. The first officer looked the bay over one last time with a critical eye and then walked out, a mere feet away from Stenstrom. He drifted in undetected. As soon as the first officer left the area, the two crewmen stopped what they were doing and started flirting, hugging, and giggling. Lessa, come here, Lessa, the male said as he put his arms around her. Stenstrom paid them no mind and searched the area. He immediately saw what he was looking for. Two large helmets made of rough-hewn stone laid out on a table in the second row. They seemed primitive and poorly made. If they were wondrous elder texts, as Alesta had said, then they hid their secrets well. The two crewmen were becoming intimate. Gordon, the female purred as he kissed her neck. She might come back. <laughs> Gordon... The male crewman picked her up and set her down on a table. Stenstrom, wishing to give them more privacy, took the two helmets and exited the bay. He encountered no one along the way and was out of the ship with the prizes in hand in no time. And with that, we conclude Part 2, Chapter 4, Sarfortnum College. Lots of interruptions in this reading. My neighbor with his boat, the SS Better Than Daughter, that's what I call it because he spends more time preening on the boat than he does his daughter was firing up its engines and doing this and that and who knows what and I had to stop and restart my dogs and my ah I, I the the things I do to bring you quality content on YouTube unmonetized I might add so they head down to Sir Fortnum College Gwen apparently is an advocate of museums which Stenstrom was not aware of, they find a, a display of Vith artifacts and come across Captain Duval and his first officer, Lieutenant Rem Deckard. And if in the Shadow Tech Goddess books, we see the same characters popping up over and over again. So if you've read Stenabel, you're familiar with Captain Duval and Lieutenant Rem Deckard. And even the two crewmen who were doing a poor job watching and cataloging these items who are about to get busy right there on, on a table in the cargo hold, Lessa and Gordon, we see them in Stenabel too. Lessa is like usually the a just like a, a normal person who's finds herself in horrible situations and needs to be rescued. Stenabel had to rescue her and we'll see what happens her, to her in this book as well. Gordon is usually her love interest and bad things usually happen to Gordon. If you recall to the beginning of the Shadow Tech Goddess, that weird prologue chapter called St. Mary's Axe, that was referring to Captain Duval, captain of the sprint ship George Parr. That chapter was talking about him, and here he is. And apparently he's working for Hannah Ben 
your lamp. Apparently you give a, a war hero enough money and they'll do anything. So there we are. Stenstrom goes. The artifacts have been taken from the museum and are locked away aboard the ship. And along the way, he encounters a demon hiding in the amphitheater. Kind of a creepy scene. And she pummels him with this wall of fear. Just like what happened to him under the ruins of Clovis. He manages to get away. And he sneaks in and steals the two helmets. And that's where we are. Next chapter, part two, chapter five, spun around. We'll see how these things go. And as I said, we're not done with Hannah Ben Sherlamp, not by a long shot. Thanks again to my great friend Cass Peace for reading Hannah Ben Sherlamp's lines. Just a brief moment in this chapter, but well done by Cass. Thank you so much. We'll be having Cass join us again in the f- upcoming chapters as we're not done with the with the professor, that's, that's for sure. So next week, Spun Around should be fun. Until then, this is Ren Presents. I'm your host, Ren. Peace out. 